Thank you for listening to a Sunday morning sermon from First Christian Church. For more information about these sermons or FCC in general, visit us online at FCCFlora.com. Over the last several weeks, over this last month, we've been going through a series, and this series has been titled Leave Your Mark. As we've gone through the book of Mark, and we've examined just how God calls the church to be a difference maker. And so often in our world and our culture, sometimes it seems so difficult, but it's easy to, to feel like, Man, it's so restricting, and there's so many different things in our schedules and our time that makes it difficult to actually feel like you can make a difference. You feel like your life is insignificant. It doesn't have enough value. You don't care enough weight. You're not talented. Now, all those different things on top of just being busy and all the good causes and different opinions and ideas that go on, it can be easy to stop in your tracks, to limit what God is leading you to do rather than to step full in the faith and say, God, use me. Use me however you see fit. And so today we're going to finish our series, our series that we continue to examine of what life is meant to be. And so when we think about this, to to leave your mark, it's to be living in the new, to be living in what Jesus has called you into, this new life that he's given us, that we get to share together to overcome the distractions and see that world change is truly as possible and it's promised through God's word. So if you would, we're going to start with a word of prayer as we get started. If you'd join me as we go before God. Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you now, and God, as we humble ourselves before you, that, God, we understand our need and desire for you, that, God, that, yes, you have created us, and you've created this world, and, God, you just call us back to you. And so, God, I pray today as we just take a moment, we we take a step back from our schedules and our busyness, that, God, we would sense what you'd have to say to us. That, God, we would hear you clearly. A longing of our hearts to move after you. Lord, we thank you for the love that you have for us. The love that you would send your son to the cross to die for us. That we would truly be new. Lord, it's in everything we do. Our thanks and our praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Last week, we left this thought, and several of you have commented on that week of how powerful and how thought-provoking that was for you, but it was that process of, is Jesus on us or is he in us? And we, this comes from the stories of the rabbis as the culture, as you'd go through this process, if you were following after your rabbi closely, you would be following so closely that they walked, they would stir up dust, and the dust of the rabbi would fall upon you. But while here Jesus is with his disciples, as we looked at last week at this teachable moment, They encountered this time, and as they go out, they looked at these massive stones, the structure of the temple, and they said, look how beautiful it is. When will all this take place? And there we see Jesus do something. He takes a moment, he says, let's sit, let's talk about this. And in that moment, we encounter Jesus slowing things down and showing them, okay, don't be distracted. And for the disciples, they were just there as Jesus was teaching, and yes, they had the dust of the rabbi on them, but was he truly in them? And it's a calling for us to continue to be all in, to be committed. And for you and I, it's that same thing now, that you and I, that we would be all in to the gospel, to the love of Jesus that he's poured out for us. And I began to think about this week as we expand upon this idea and we continue to examine what it means to live with Jesus, to live every single day, to be leaving our mark in what we do. And it's understanding of where and what has been done for us. Uh, I don't know about you, for many of you, you might be a connoisseur of shoes. Ladies, I don't know how many shoes you have in your closet, but it might be a bunch. We won't get into numbers. But some of you boys, you might be, have a large collection of shoes as well. I know I, I'm a connoisseur of shoes. I don't have a lot of shoes because they cost a lot of money, right? But I do like shoes. I have been coming, the last several years I've been enjoying looking at shoes. When I coached, I like to have nice, cool shoes on that were just stood out, you know. Try to get Coach Lee to do it, but he always bailed on me, so... Rocked it by myself. But what I've learned is that this week I was commenting on a pair of shoes. I saw a pair of Jordans and they were retros. I was like, I like those. Those are cool. And I went up and I said, those are awesome shoes. Just trying to start a conversation. And this is what I got back. Thanks, they're old. And I'm like, those are nice shoes. And then it hit me as I was examining the text this week, as I was examining life and the gospel here. I wonder what the moment was. I wonder what the situation was when those shoes became old. When they're no longer exciting to put on, when you're no longer proud of them, 
and they're just old. See, we all have that old pair of shoes that you have around the house that you probably do stuff in the yard and that your wife tells you, your spouse tells you not to leave the house in. Those are not to be seen outside of this place. But I wonder about that moment of, of what changed. And then it kind of scared me because like those shoes, when you first got them, they came at a cost. You took care of them, you guarded them, you were excited about them, and then something changed. You're no longer excited. You tell yourself, I can get them dirty because they have no worth anymore. Is our faith like that? When we first encountered Jesus, we were excited. It was new, it was fresh. And then over time, it, it lost its value, it lost its worth. Hopefully we even got there. But sometimes it goes to understand what was really done for us. And what I kept examining with this idea was the living in the new of just dying for us was, is living in the new to accepting this new life. Is that just something that we said for far too long and we lost the true meaning of it? You know, I've had those moments in games when I was coaching and you know, I'd cry out and I'd say something, a statement over and over again. And then I realized at the end of the game, they had no clue what I was trying to say. I wasn't communicating it clearly. Is that what the gospel's become? We said something for far too long and it's lost its clarity. Or there's no meaning behind it. I was reminded of when we were playing basketball in college and we were on a trip down to Tennessee. And anytime someone pays you a good chunk of money to come play them, it usually means they're trying to pad their schedule. You're preparing to take a loss, but you get good money for it, right? So we did. We went down there and we took our amazing loss. We got paid for it. But something happened while we were there. And we were in the midst of a game when we were getting blown out. And our center, he's down the middle of the lane. He's playing lockdown defense. He's got the stance. He's assumed the position. He sees his man. He sees ball. Here comes the ball. And out of nowhere, you see this amazing swat. Boom. He hits that thing out there to the cheap seats. He is so fired up that he got that pass. No one else was. Let's set the context for you. He was standing in the middle of the lane. And the pass he swatted was from the referee to the free throw shooter. He had missed the point. And I, I, while we were there, we're all looking. I'm like, what are you doing? Coach, his conversation to him was something I'll never forget. And he asked him this question, do you know what's going on? And his response was simple. He goes, yes, I just don't understand. Oh, that's a loaded question. Because when you think about our lives and you think about us and our faith and our journey and our walk, how many people are coming to Jesus saying, I understand, I just don't understand. I know, I just don't know. See, it's so simple to miss it. And that was last week. They just missed their mark. Even though Jesus was right there, they missed it. So how can we focus it on who Jesus is to understand what was done for us and to understand our reaction in the way that we are called to live? We see this in the book of Mark as we finish up our series of Mark today, but if you would turn to Mark chapter 15 is where we're going to find ourselves today. It'll also be on the screen if you want to follow along. But this is one of those, those passages as I read over and over again as I examined scriptures this week. I wrestled with God a lot on this, of where he was going to go and how he's going to use this. And if you ever drive by and you see me circling the lot, that's me wrestling with God, all right? I often be talking to myself and praying and saying, I don't want to say that and do all that kind of stuff, you know. But this is where God led me. As I was out there walking this week and, and wrestling with this, he kept bringing me back to this passage. And this is actually the part where we begin to see the end and the beginning of our newness. The Mark chapter 15, verse 33 is where we're going to start. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Some ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. He said with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his lap. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw he had died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. What's remarkable about this is you, you begin to see the context of this passage here. 
First off, you sense the agony and the pain of what was taking place. I mean, travel there with me. The, the pain of what is going on right now as he's at his very end. He's already gone through all the trials. He's gone through the torture. And here he is in his last moments, hanging on. But here's what we begin to see. The darkness that is symbolized here is the darkness of the creator, giving himself for his creation. The creator's suffering with us. But what we begin to see is the notable occasion of this is in the time of the Passover, it would be during a full moon. So a natural eclipse of the sun was impossible. So only through our God would he set the stage for this moment. Imagine that. Once again, the creator, he can move, align, and change. And so here we begin to see in this agonizing moment, he's actually calling out from Psalms chapter 22. Let's see this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David's first line is the same words that Jesus uses on the cross. What? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises, and you're, in you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out, and you saved them. And you they trusted you, they put not to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me and they hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, and they said, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. So he writes out in Psalms here is the same thing, that agonizing scene of pain, agony. And here David is, he feels that he's in this moment, a situation that once again that David finds himself in. God, why would you leave me here? Why wouldn't you just rescue me? Why don't you change this in my life? See, it's similar to the same cries that we cry out so often. Lord, take this, remove this, change this. And yet all those times God would walk with David through those. But here we begin to see that as Jesus uses on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God. This repetitive notion, not only does he have a relationship with God, but also here in this moment, he's relying on the significance of his agony and pain. The urgency, the need, the longing to have this right now. God, God, my God, my God, where are you? And yet in this moment, Forsaken is the, the change that takes place here. So often we think it's the vibe, but what we understand about God is that God is good all the time. All the time, right? Do we believe that? Okay. So if we believe that if God is good and God is good all the time, there's one thing that God cannot be. That's bad. So the forsaken nature here is, isn't that God a despise sin, that God was afraid of sin, or, but it was because Jesus had to become sin. He had to become the one thing that God could not be. And so in this moment, you begin to see it unfold for us. And pull yourself into this moment, because here you begin to see that why hasn't you saved me yet? As David cried out, where are you, Lord? Where are you? And what we understand about living in the new is to understand that each and every moment of your day is going to be different. And it's going to be a challenge and it's going to be a trial and you're going to have good days and bad days. You're going to have moments that you feel like you're on top of the world and days where you feel like you're at the very bottom and God has abandoned you and God has forsaken you. But what we understand is that God has not forsaken us because you and I are here 2,000 years later still waiting for his return. If we felt like God would abandon us, we would have left long ago. So living in the new is living in anticipation of our king returning. To understanding of what is taking place for us. So no matter what we go through or what we experience, that God is still there longing after us. Seeking out after us. But here he is in this moment, forsaken by the sin that he has taken for us, taken from us. Our sin, our shame, our sorrow, all those things are put on the cross. And because of that, now we sense and we understand the forsaken nature of God. Because I hate to tell you as your pastor, I'm sinful. I'll be honest with you. I hate to admit that to you, but I am. 
But lucky for you and I, my God's bigger. That my God is stronger, that my God is not threatened by sin. See, so often we think that God will run and he'll flee and forsake. He didn't have to forsake him. Even though he couldn't be sin, he doesn't abandon us. And for you and I, we trust and we love in a God that is bigger than our sin, our sorrow, our pain, and our hurts. And in this passage right here, you begin to see it unfold for us. That as here he is in this moment, he reminds us of who he is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, that he's declaring that you and I, because of what was done on the cross, that we would be the righteousness of God, that we would go and to live in a way, in a manner that is worthy of the righteousness of God, a declaration of freedom that you and I are a new life and a new opportunity, a new spirit that God dwells inside of you. And the problem is that the sin of ours that was laid on that cross, that the blood was shed for, has lost its worth. In the same way as our shoes, they've gotten old and there's no worth. In the same way as our faith, it's lost its moment. It's lost its pinnacle. The hierarchy of how much joy was there. For us to live in the new is to encounter that spirit, to understand that you and I, because of what was done then, was done yesterday as well. And the forgiveness of our sins, a renewing of our spirit as the Holy Spirit has come upon us and dwells inside of us, that we are a new creation. And to live in the new is to live as that new creation, to dwell in the word that you understand your value that God has placed upon you. The cost that was paid for you is to be reciprocated by our lives and our love. Dan Spader writes about this four chairs. And if you've ever seen this, it's the four chair Christianity, the steps of faith. And he breaks it down in a manner in a way that we begin to speak. And it says the journey of faith goes through this process. And chair one, it also talks about just becoming aware that this is when your eyes are open, that you say, there is a Lord, I need him. I understand that this is what takes place. But this is where it gets scary. It's that chair too. You often describe this as the infant stage, the birth stage, the process where we grow and where we learn. But it's also being referred to as the spiritual CPR stage. This is the scary part. If you've ever seen someone who's been on life support, who wasn't breathing for themselves or it's that moment. Well, yes, you're alive, but you're not really functioning. This is the stage that wears you out. This is the stage that many hold on to. Others are feeding into you, but you don't have to breathe for yourself and live for yourself. But it's exhausting. It wears you down. And what we begin to see is the call is but living in the new, that you're willing to take the steps in the chair three to be a spiritual worker, to be a spiritual warrior in prayer, and then four, to be a disciple who's willing to share the gospel, to share what Jesus is doing in your life right now. That's what leaving your mark is. To be the overflow of our lives, we're sharing everything of who he is. And it's in the new. And in this, we begin to see that in the passage here, and what I love about this is you begin to see is the veil tearing here, a symbolic gesture of the temple here, that there's a veil that separated the Jews and Gentiles inside of here. Funny to think that we thought we invented church divide and church split. The veil was already there, splitting the church, separating people. And what we begin to see is many scholars believe that as the veil was torn, as people would come into the temple, and you know about the temple is a place for the holies of holies presence of God, where they're able to encounter him. When the veil was torn, the scholars have found that the ark wasn't there. It's amazing to think the ark had moved. In this magnificent temple in this place, when the veil was torn down, all those who kept coming there for the presence of God, he wasn't there. The presence of God was on the tree. They had missed their moment. And here's the thing. That veil had shielded that for so many years. The question is, what veils do we have in our lives that have caused separation, divide, or split? See, for them, this veil kept people from seeing and experiencing the presence of God. 
For us to live in the new is to remove, to divide the veils that have caused separation, have caused people from not seeing Jesus in our lives, and to encounter him in a real way. But this is overcoming so many different things in our lives. We have to overcome the trials that we face and the lies that we tell ourselves and the agony of unbelief. And we say to ourselves, am I really who I say I am? Am I really able to do this? Am I good enough? Am I talented enough? Am I worthy enough? All those lies we tell us, our journey becomes when we take unbelief and make it belief. When we trust in Jesus, when we begin to see in Hebrews chapter 11, it calls us to live by faith. And he gives the stories and the examples of Noah, Moses, and Rahab, and David, and Samuel as they were able to live by their faith, to share it out, to be bold in who they were called to be. But then we see in Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us that we'd be a great cloud of witness, that we'd go in to testify. But as they say, as you live this life, as you share in this moment, do you begin to see that it gives us three things to be particular about, two in the past and one in the present. In the past, anything that hinders or entangles us. And in the future, to run with perseverance. And what he says is it's throwing off the past, to leave it behind, that's the hardest thing we can do because that's what's been our identity for so many years. That's who I was. That's what I've done. And he says we have to throw it aside. In Hebrew 12, 2, like Stacy read earlier, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scoring its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's not just about knowing but understanding of what was done for us. And what's so amazing about this passage here in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 2, it's following up in what was stated in Psalms 22. This perfect imagery, how God's voice was heard through generation into generation. But what we begin to see as we persevere, as we run the race, we, we pursue holiness comes at a challenge. So we often don't live in the new because it's painful. Transformation is painful. Encountering Jesus in a real way of letting go of who we are can be painful. But here's what we begin to see. I quote Francis Chan. Uh, what he says is this. He says, Americans are more likely to take a selfie with Moses than to climb the mountain to encounter God themselves. Do you hear that? As Americans, we were more likely to take a selfie with Moses than to climb the mountain to encounter God ourselves. Because transformation is painful. To climb the mountain to encounter God can be difficult. Sometimes we don't want to go there. We're afraid of what that experience will be like and what we'll see and what he'll say. But God, our creator, already knows us. He knows you and I. He knows everything about us, good and bad. And yet for many of us, he's calling us into that moment that we would climb the mountain and count them ourselves. It's easy to build our faith through others. It's easy to, to follow people on social media and be like, yeah, that's awesome. That's great faith. I'll like that, share that. That's just a selfie with Moses. Are you encountering God yourself? What was the last time that you encountered God in a way that you did not want to leave? You felt his presence so strong. In that moment, you said, there's nothing else I can do but be here with you. And finally, we begin to see at the end of this passage, it is finished. Which means paid in full. For him to finish it, to pay in full, it had to be painful. To be complete. Why would our transformation be anything less than a desire for it to be complete? As we begin to see this, as we encounter Jesus every day, and you read in word with him, the question arose in my mind this week as I was walking. It was this, if Jesus was in connection to God, 
and he came to separate us from sin, we too should seek to separate ourselves from sin to connect to God. What are we doing to connect ourselves with God? Are we willing to take the steps to climb the mountain? To have an understanding that our value never decreases. Our worth is always as valuable as can be because it was the son of Jesus that paid for it. So my challenge for you this week is not to live in our past, but rather live in Jesus' future. We can't go and declare the gospel and still live in our past. But he's calling us to live in the future and what he is doing. And we let Jesus shine through us. And we trust him every day, remembering who he is, what he's done, and what he is doing.